Welcome to How to Plan an Elder Justice Network Convening Webinar. This is the first webinar in a series discussing approaches to combating elder financial exploitation. This webinar will be recorded and shared with registrants after today's session. Before we get started, I'd like to talk a little bit about how you can use the platform today. On the far left of your screen, you'll see the Q&A box. For any content-related questions that you'd like to ask our presenters, please put them in there, and we'll ask as many as we can at the end of our session. In the middle of your screen, you'll see the EFPRN FAQs and links, and answers to common questions, as well as links to popular resources, including the link to the playlist with past recordings of previous webinars. And then on the right, you'll see the chat box. Feel free to introduce yourself and let us know where you're calling in from and your organization. I'd now like to welcome Paul Greenwood, who will be our moderator for today's session. Well, thank you so much, uh, Nicole, and thank you all for joining us uh, for today's uh, first uh, webinar of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's Office of Older Americans Combating Elder Financial Exploitation Series. And uh, this is the only time I'm going to say that full name. So from now on, I'm going to use the initial CFPB, okay, if you don't mind. And this first in the series consists of four webinars today until uh, June 1st. And so we hope that you may be able to join us uh, for at least uh, one or more of the other three remaining. And I'm looking through the, the chat box here. It is thrilling to see such a diversity of our audience uh, with uh, professionals from all uh, parts of the United States. And even I have to give a special kudos to Jessica Lee from the Guam Elder Justice Center. I just looked up what time of day it is in Guam. It's Thursday morning at 4 a.m. So I think we need to give a bit Special shout out to Jessica for making a, a, an amazing effort to be with us uh, today. But thank you all uh, for, for being with us because I really believe this is such an important topic. This whole series builds on concepts from the Combating Elder Financial Exploitation webinar series that we held in the months of February and March this year, which provided some foundational information on elder fraud prevention and response networks and the various resources that CFPB have available. And in fact, all these webinars that I've just referred to uh, were recorded and are available on a YouTube playlist, which you can find in, in one of the boxes below. So today's webinar is entitled How to Plan an elder justice uh, network convening. And such a convening is an effective way uh, to bring stakeholders and community leaders together to create a collaborative network. Convenings gather professionals from across all sectors and disciplines, just like is reflected in, in today's um, chat room. And those of you who are st still joining, please, Put in your name and, and who you work for and who you're with, because that is so, so encouraging to all of us. So the, the various professionals, financial institutions, law enforcement, prosecution, which, of course, is very close to my heart, uh, adult protective services, area agencies on aging and others. And this is to start or in some cases to expand and increase collaboration to combat uh, elder financial exploitation. Now, you know that a webinar would not be complete without a disclaimer, right? I mean, we have to do that in all walks of life. So forgive me, but just bear with me because this presentation is being made by CFPB representatives on behalf of their bureau. It doesn't constitute legal interpretation, guidance, or advice of the Bureau. Any opinions or views stated by the presenter are their own and may not represent the Bureau's views. So this document includes links or references to third-party resources. The inclusion of links or references to such sites does not necessarily reflect the Bureau's endorsement of the third party or the views expressed on that site or the products or services offered on that site. 
The Bureau has not had the opportunity to vet these third parties or their content or any products or services that may be offered. There may be other possible entities or resources that are not listed that may also serve your needs. So there we go. We've got the disclaimer full and center out of the way. And what I'd like to do now is, is uh, to save time, is introduce everybody at the beginning so that when we start the full presentations, uh, there's no need to interrupt and, and then uh, give another introduction. Um, so just a little bit about myself. Um, I, am a, I was a 25-year career prosecutor with the San Diego District Attorney's Office. Before that, I was a lawyer in England for 13 years. So I've been a lawyer for over 40 years. But during those 25 years uh, in the DA's office in San Diego, I had the great privilege of leading a brand new unit starting in 1996 called Elder Protection. And I was so fortunate to spend 22 years learning and prosecuting, doing trials, ranging from homicides, sexual assaults, financial exploitation, neglect, and of course, a lot of financial exploitation. But the one thing that I can take, bring back to you is the essential need for networking. I could not have stood up in a courtroom many times and give an opening statement without the, the networking that had gone on to make that case a reality. So I, I'm a passionate believer in, in these uh, networking com, um, opportunities, and I'm so glad that you are going to take advantage of that. So I also now want to introduce to you Jennifer Duane, who has been a personal friend of myself and my wife for many, many years. She, she's been with the Bureau since uh, 2011, where she serves as the senior program analyst in the Office of Financial Protection for Older Americans. Um, particularly, she leads the award-winning Money Smart for Older Adults program and also leads the Elder Fraud Prevention and Response Network program to build collaboration. Um, and in her prior career, uh, she was the founder of the nonprofit Elder Financial Protection Network in California. And that's how I met Jennifer, because I was able to find her and reach out to her and say, we need to train banks and credit unions to spot red flags. And bless her heart, she came to San Diego and we formed a partnership and, and we developed some terrific uh, programs for financial institutions. So it's great to have um, Jennifer with us. With her is her colleague, uh, Lisa Shipley, who is a senior policy analyst at the Bureau, and she leads the Managing Someone Else's Money financial caregiving program, as well as the Money Smart for Older Adults program, and supports the Bureau's work to combat elder financial exploitation through network collaboration and age-friendly banking. Her career in consumer protection spans more than 20 years. She's also worked for the FTC for 12 years, where she's been involved in a lot of trainings for consumers, businesses, and advocates, and has also been with the Maryland Illegal Aid Bureau as a staff attorney and supervising attorney. So she comes to us with tremendous background and experience too. I'm also delighted to welcome to the, to the panel, Ben Miller, who is a senior director for community development at ICF. And you know, I was interested in those acronyms, ICF, and I looked it up and I realized it, it actually stands for Inner City Fund. A and ICF has an amazing history. It was uh, founded back in 1969 by a former Tuscany airman, along with three US Department of Defense analysts. And they focused primarily on offering financing to minority-owned businesses in Washington, D.C. But since then, ICF has become a global advisory and technology services uh, provider. So we're very fortunate to have Ben with us. He, his focus is on financial capabilities and community development. And he leads financial education curriculum development for ICF support for the FDIC Money Smart Initiative and so much more. And then finally, we have Tim Arthur with us, who is the Deputy Secretary for the Pennsylvania Department of Banking and Securities. Tim oversees their financial services for consumers and business unit with responsibility for outreach and engagement and consumer 
complaints. Previously, Tim was the department's policy director and had prior roles with the Pennsylvania Association of Community Bankers and with the office of Congressman uh, Tim Holden. So ladies and gentlemen, I think you can see we have uh, brought together a very uh, experienced panel. And with that, I'm gonna now hand over to Jennifer to take it from here. Good, good afternoon, Jennifer. Hi, Paul, thank you so much for that. Um, hello, everybody. I'm super delighted to be here today and with my colleagues on the panel. And um, gosh, it's uh, I really appreciate everybody taking out the time. Um, so as uh, was mentioned in the intro, uh, I, myself, and Lisa schiffer -Lee on the call, my colleague from the Bureau, uh, we're both with the Office for Older Americans at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And as you can see, we're a regulator that, um, uh, that uh, oversees the provision of consumer financial products and services under what is known as the federal consumer financial laws. And we enforce federal consumer financial laws fairly and consistently. And we also work to educate and empower consumers making financial decisions and that's a, di a division we belong to, Lisa and I now called uh, consumer populations and their special population offices, older Americans. Um, we have one called community affairs, which deals with economically disadvantaged people of all ages. Um, we have another that's the office of service member affairs. And we also have an office of um, students, which has a new name um, having to do with the student loan issues in the country. And then, of course, we have our uh, regs and uh, market research, market monitoring and regulations department. We have an enforcement department and a couple of others. But um, we were established in uh, 2012 as a bureau, sorry, 2010 as a bureau. And um, the and I joined in 2011. And I'm, it's been a, quite a journey. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity and for all of you who do such great work out in the field who can help us to elevate lift up your work and hopefully provide some supports um, and, and a lot of different fronts for older adults, not just elder financial exploitation, but you can learn more about that at our website, consumerfinance.gov forward slash older Americans. All right, so moving along, the objectives, objectives of today are to just, we'll briefly define elder justice convenings. We'll delve into the practical planning considerations for forming a, a planning team, conducting the outreach for your convening, designing your convening, and maintaining momentum after your convening, which is always the most difficult part. Um, mo mo maintaining momentum is hard under any circumstances, but it definitely, you know, these events are very dynamic and the trick is to keep them going and build upon them. Um, we will showcase some road tested convening planning resources and um, talk to you about considering how to effectively build networks in rural uh, communities, which is a big focus these days for a lot of reasons you will hear about later. So our elder fraud prevention and response network program has been around since 2013, but we did a study in 2016 um, to really delve into who are these networks? Where are they? What do they do? How are they composed? And we found close to a thousand networks across the country, many of them under particular headings, different profiles, different, um, you know, different sort of leadership, um, it, it very, very, very varied collection of collaborative partnerships. They're sometimes known as multidisciplinary teams, just generally elder, elder abuse multidisciplinary teams. They can be also financial abuse specialist teams. They can be elder abuse coalitions or elder abuse prevention coalitions, task forces, and even elder justice coalitions or elder justice networks. So there's a lot of different names for them. But what we found um, through the study was the network is basically a sustained usually voluntary, although people, uh, professionals are engaged, but they often voluntarily come together to collaborate or partner on prevention, detection, and responding to elder financial exploitation. And we found that they have great benefits. Uh, there's great benefits in bringing people together, um, the elder justice professionals, 
uh, increase, increases in reporting happen. And sometimes that's more uh, from the field due to uh, the efforts of the network in raising community awareness, but also there's increased reporting uh, across agencies. Uh, we call it cross-reporting or interagency reporting, like when a financial institution reports to APS and then APS reports to law enforcement. So the interagency referral of cases increases, but the reporting as well. Um, improved response takes place when there is collaboration and cooperation between responders and other stakeholders. Um, the members of network skills are improved and enhanced, um, and so is their capacity to address financial exploitation just by virtue of getting to know each other and getting to know who's who and what they do and what they don't do. Um, and as you may know, um, all the state laws are different. The Welfare and Institutions Codes or the APS laws in different states vary. Um, and then, of course, you've got the federal laws and the, and the state laws and then sometimes local ordinances, et cetera, that may play a part. So having this collaboration and cooperation uh, between and you know regular meetings helps to keep everybody clear and up to date and it builds relationships which is the biggest thing it's the most important thing i believe about uh, building developing having a network having um, is having um, cooperation and collaboration through relationships um, you can get a lot more done when you know people and you are have a congenial relationship with them so coordination um, is improved and the use of agency and community resources. And I have one example I'll share. I'll never forget being in a meeting where, where a group came together for the first time. There was no formal network or collaboration between any agencies in this particular uh, area in North uh, Florida. And one of the uh, police officers that was there, I think he was actually a little higher than officer. He was, uh, I think, a lieutenant. He, he was also an elder service officer. He had a special designation to respond to calls for, uh, that concerned older people. And he was stunned after everybody went around the room and introduced themselves because he was not aware of so many of the services that were available that he would then he could have been calling upon. And he was so grateful. And we heard the same in Vermont um, from certain agencies saying, wow, I didn't know you did that. And I didn't know I didn't know what you could or couldn't do. Um, so all of this hopefully increases collaboration when it comes time for investigations, which is really the hard part. I mean, getting getting through the gate is the first part, getting to know each other. But then um, when it gets down to brass tacks, the response often needs to result in an investigation. Um, and that is where the rubber meets the road and where everybody really needs to uh, hopefully work together to make those happen quickly, smoothly, and effectively. Um, the goal of convening is to bring stakeholders together to explore how you all can build collaboration to prevent and resolve cases of elder financial exploitation, and hopefully prevent losses. I like to say early intervention results in loss prevention. We hope most of the time that is the case, but. Sometimes it's difficult. Those of you who have experienced a, a romance scam uh, or an older person going through a romance scam, sometimes those are very hard to stop. Um, and of course, the person's capacity comes into play and all sorts of nuances that I won't have time to get into here, but early intervention, loss prevention, collaboration can lead to that. So uh, the existing networks that are out there and convenings that, that we're going to talk about today are often the catalyst for the formation of new networks or sister networks. Um, a region may have two or three networks or a state may have a couple or 20, um, but having one um, often results in others nearby paying attention and saying, hey, we need to do that where we are. And they will often uh, lock arms with you to find out uh, what you're doing or you can do that with them to find out what's working what's not working or how to navigate or sometimes coming together to uh to seek a fund a fund uh, some funding from a foundation that says hey we want to help with this um and then of course that means replication and hopefully encouraging statewide coverage that's uh one of our 
main goals in all of this is statewide coverage ultimately. It'll take a while, but we're seeing them pop up everywhere. Um, we developed a guide in 2020. It was released uh, actually just about, we're just about coming up on the anniversary here. It was right at the start of the pandemic. It's the Elder Fraud Prevention and Response Network uh, Development Guide. It is an online guide to help local leaders create new networks and expand the capacity of existing ones. So this is, you know, sort of a toolkit. We call it a resource uh, development guide, but it has a sort of step-by-step -step and lots of tools in it to help you to plan your meetings and whatnot. We'll go over those in a little bit. You can find it at consumerfinance.gov four slash elder networks, consumerfinance.gov four slash elder networks. So in our work since 2017, after the study, we went out into the field and we hit all these places. Um, we have done 17 network convenings in 15, uh, 15 states, one of which was uh, the not a state, it was a nationwide LGBTQ network uh, convening that was virtual. So a little bit of variation on our themes here, but we have worked in 15 states and nationwide and twice in Hawaii um, to help new networks form and to help existing networks increase their capacity and enhance their impact and to replicate. So a poll. Let's do the poll. Who is here today? Please participate. Great, I see we have lots of financial institutions. They're taking the lead. Oop. Followed closely by other. If you are other, you might want to put in the chat what other is. Other equals and let us know because I'd love to know who the others are. All right, looking like it might be coming static. There we go. All right, so it looks like we have, I'm gonna scroll up here a little bit. Looks like a lot of people have not even started, considered planning a convening yet. So we'll be getting into that next. All right, so the core planning team. Um, I am delighted to have worked with every single one of the core planning teams that have come together in the last, uh, in those 17 convenings that we've done. So the first, the first sort of step to planning a convening is getting a steering committee together for your effort. Um, we advise that it not be too big. Um, although we've seen 10, 12, sometimes 14 come together and do a fantastic job, but we find that groups of six, eight, and 10 are, you know, a good number um, if everybody's committed and can make it to most, if not all, the meetings. Members often include adult protective services, sometimes representatives of the state attorney general's office. Um, it is wonderful if you can get your state elder justice coordinator from your U.S. attorney's office involved, um, financial professionals, sometimes leadership from your state Credit Union League or your Bankers Association is really, really helpful because they have the ear of all of their membership and can really be helpful with your invitations, et cetera. And having them on board also builds a relationship with those who have a lot of influence over your state laws, et cetera. Um, and then the financial uh, professionals themselves, I'd strongly encourage you to consider Payments Association uh, leadership. And we can... Uh, we can talk about that a little bit later. If you want to learn more about payments associations, um, just put a little note in the chat and we'll try to answer a question about it later. Um, law enforcement of all types, which also includes U.S. Attorney's Office, legal service providers, senior service providers, et cetera. Again, try to find you know a core motivated group. Um, and then for those that you, you know can't fill in the blank on, you can invite them later. Um, so the core group works to define goals for the convening, choose the venue, collaborate on the outreach and marketing, designing the convening, and driving that follow-up post-convening. Um, 
And I want to say that the four to eight or 10 people that you might have on your planning team do not necessarily do everything. Some folks have staff or resources where they can call upon someone to help with the graphics or with production or with some other aspect of uh, executing or producing the event. So even though it seems like a few, it's a leadership team who then often will recruit other help to make the convening happen. So you want to engage partners that bring connections, that bring name recognition, who are speakers, trainers, and facilitators, um, and who have space or can find space. And then here's a reflection question for you. Um, if you were to have a core planning team in your area, if you already have one, or if you would like to have one, who would you approach who's in your area? Feel free to put your answers in the chat because different areas have different profiles. You may not have um, some of the federal law enforcement if you're in a very rural area. You may not have um, certain financial institutions, although you may have a lot of others. So what do you think about who you would, who you would like to engage in your core planning team? And then about defining success. Um, some examples from our past convenings include um, new relationships being started with financial institutions at our at the various events we have facilitated. Um, there has been the identification and information sharing opportunities about barriers and limitations, which I talked about. Um, there's a lot of awareness raising among the people who uh, who run the local resources, such as, you know, the area agencies on aging, the senior service providers, the legal service providers, and et cetera, and et cetera um, about capabilities for investigating potential um, elder financial exploitation. Looking at your, I'm getting distracted by your, your great uh, answers here. Um, and also starting or restarting local case review meetings. And this is an area that is, it can be a little complex, but case review is so important. It really helps to get to the bottom of it, and, and it, it's really the essence of collaboration when there is an investigation or at least a look-see. Um, and it doesn't always have to be about prosecution. It could be just about how to protect a very vulnerable elder from financial exploitation even before they've been exploited. That would be ideal um, where there's a report of someone vulnerable. But in most cases, the case review teams are really sitting down to bring together expertise uh, very confidentially to try to come up with a game plan for either, you know, both protection of assets, but also um, possibly uh, building a case for prosecution. What else defines success? Anybody have ideas from your own uh, networks as to what, what defines success to you? please go ahead and put your thoughts in the chat. We learn from you, by the way. Um, this is one of the wonderful things about this work um, is everybody is constantly learning from each other, and it's a huge benefit. Nobody knows more than anyone else. Financial institutions know a lot about this that you might, might really surprise you. And same with, uh, of course, law enforcement has their perspective, adult protective services has their perspective, legal services has their perspective. So. Um, you know, this, often the success is really learning from each other. They show up and develop trust in you. Thank you. That is a great answer. All right. Um, the court uh, team, some tips and tools. We have a stakeholder planning guide in Excel. Um, it's really more of like an invitation list, but it has a list of stakeholders so that you don't have to scratch your head for too long to think about who should we invite. You can actually go down this list, and of course, you can add to the list or you can subtract from the list. But in terms of who are the stakeholders, we've done a lot of that groundwork and, we, and we've learned from others how, um, how that looks. Um, and then we have in-person and virtual convening planning timelines. In PDF, we have a dynamic timeline in there. So you can, uh, you can put in uh, the date of your event, your target date, and then you can work backwards with all the tasks that are already preloaded in there for what you need to get done by when. 
and that helps everybody to stay on schedule. You can use that to check in with your planning meetings, with your planning team. You can identify where you need resources to do certain certain things and um, you know get help from staff or whatnot, like finding facilitators for your sessions or whatever. Um, so it's a master timeline that's dynamic and it's on the, uh, the, the network development tool at consumerfinance.gov for slash elder networks. All right, now I turn it over to Lisa. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. This is Lisa Schifferly from the CFPB's Office for Older Americans. And now that Jennifer has talked to you about assembling your core team and outlining general goals and setting up a timeline, I'm going to talk to you about the next step, which is beginning outreach to participants of your convening. So here are some tips for outreach about your convening. Next slide, please. The whole core team should brainstorm invitees to include multiple aspects of elder justice. So think about all the stakeholders that you can bring together. A lot of the people that are on this call, whether it's financial institutions, APS, law enforcement, elder law advocates, or elder law professionals. We have a stakeholder planning guide that's part of that online network development guide that Jennifer mentioned. And you can use that to think about who are some of the stakeholders that you want to bring to your convening. You might want to think about considering leaders and experts outside your immediate geographic area in addition to those in your geographic area, because those outside the area might be able to provide a different perspective, or they may have an established network that you want to emulate. So often convening these participants from outside of the area can help you take back learnings to your own community. Also think about creating a registration form to track attendees once the invitation is sent out. There are lots of online tools that can help you do that. So once you've created an invitation, you're gonna to wanna to send out a save the date and then send out the invitation and send out the reminder. We have templates for all of this and you see a link to them at the bottom of the slide. These are all available in our online network development guide. Basically, sending the save the date gives attendees time to plan. It also lets attendees know if the event will be virtual or in person. And we generally say it's a good practice to send out that save the date about six to eight weeks before the convening. You might want to think about selecting a member of that core planning team to be in charge of sending the invitation and the save the date and responding to questions, monitoring RSVPs, all that goes into this sort of stage of the convening process. Then after you've sent the save the date, you'll wanna send the actual invitation, which includes a registration form link and logistical details, more background materials. You probably wanna send this invitation out about two or more weeks before the convening, and you may wanna attach helpful resources to let the attendees know about the purpose of the convening, or maybe even, attach information from the CFPB's website about our online network development guide or some of the other resources for networks like Money Smart for Older Adults. So you've sent out the save the date, you've sent out the invitation, and then you'll wanna also send out a reminder. And our online development guide not only has templates, but also has that timeline that Jennifer mentioned to remind you when to do each of these things. But basically the reminder email it's just to provide agenda updates and logistical information. If it's in person, you may want to talk about parking security, et cetera. It's best practice to send that email about a week before the convening. And you also will probably want to email a copy of the original invitation to anyone that hasn't confirmed just to try to up those registration numbers. And again, you can attach helpful links and resources there. Now, here are some additional outreach tips and tools. The online network development guide has a variety of these tips. We talked about the sample registration form. It includes items you might want to include on your own registration form, basics like name and email address, as well as you might want to consider asking questions that will help you plan an agenda or that address participant interests so that you can find out how you want to focus your convening. For example, if a portion of your convening agenda will feature discussion in small groups, you might wanna choose group participants based on information you gather. 
through this registration. Another tip for outreach and registration are offer lunch. Who doesn't like free food? Also think about working with sector leaders to reach out to contacts in their networks. And finally, save a few places from your total registration number for groups that might not register as quickly. We did this in our recent Colorado convening and it was very effective. For example, if you'd like financial institutions to be involved, save places for them. So if you have 50 spots, mainly cap registration at 45 and save those five extra spots for people you wanna make sure can have a spot. So those are some of our outreach tips. I'm gonna turn it over to Ben now to talk about designing your convening, and then I'll be back later to talk about later aspects of the process. Thank you so much, Lisa. And very pleased to be with you all today. Thank you so much. We've talked a little bit so far, we've talked uh, extensively about why hold a convening and what a convening is. We've also heard about uh, the uh, putting together a core planning team for your convening. We've heard about ways to approach uh, spreading the word about your convening and, and getting people registered for it. We're now going to fast forward to the convening itself and talk about what does the day look like? What are ways to, once you've assembled this great group of people from across various disciplines, what are the ways to make the most of it and make it a really effective relationship building and action-oriented uh, meeting? One of the things that as we unpack what goes into a convening that you'll notice is the approach to convenings that we advocate and, and use uses multiple session types. So you'll see as we go through agendas for uh, convenings that there's a mix of presentations, large group brainstorms and discussions, work in small groups, followed by report out, voting, and other session formats. So before we dive into that, I'd be interested to hear in chat, why do you think that that might be important and helpful to do in a convening? Why have a mix of presentations and small group work and other types of sessions? I'll give you a moment to, to type some thoughts. One thing that may be leaping to mind is, uh, oh, Andrea, you anticipated exactly what I was going to say, different learning styles. If you have one type of session where people are moving around the room, that helps the kinesthetic learners in the room really uh, get a lot out of that particular session. But there are other reasons as well. If you have a mix of small group sessions, for example, those small groups are creating relationships with each other. And part of what uh, many convenings try to do is create new relationships among the participants uh, that can be the basis for collaboration afterwards. Uh, thank you for these great ideas. All these are great dimensions of why have a kind of uh, diverse mix of sessions going into your convening. Another thing to think about as you're crafting your convening is what are the purposes of your convening? and how to do different session formats uh, achieve those objectives. If there is a, uh, a cross-training element of your convening, then you may want to have some present presentation style uh, portions of the convening, but we'll talk about various uh, session designs that uh, can all have a role. So what you can see on the slide is a Baseline convening agenda. This is on the website. It's on consumerfinance.gov slash elder networks. And this is a high level, but we think really helpful basis for you to design your own day. And we wanted to point out a couple of features of how this day plays out. Uh, after a welcome that sets the tone for the day, you'll notice that we go into varying session types as we've as we've talked about. We've got exercises to keep people engaged that start at 1030. We've got multiple breaks uh, throughout the day. We have some session components, uh, some convening components that allow time for networking and, and less formal uh, relationship building. 
among participants. You'll notice that at one o'clock and at two o'clock, we have white space, essentially. We have two unspecified sessions. And that's because each community or each state may have a uh, its own needs that are unique to, uh, to that state or that locality where you can fill that one o'clock slot or that two o'clock slot with a presentation or, or a networking opportunity or a cross training session. So we built in some of that white space for customizing. And then finally, we'll talk later about promoting sustainability and promoting uh, momentum and action after the convening. So it's important to end the day uh, with discussion of next steps and conclusions. But every convening is different and two in particular, two recent ones are great case studies in how a convening can really be customized to the needs and the, the potential and the opportunities in a particular place. So uh, Lisa already alluded to a March convening in Colorado. And one of the really interesting components of the March convening was there was a keynote address by a scholar at the University of Denver on cognition, dementia, and financial decision making. This was a really key part of the agenda in in Denver, in Colorado, because it, this topic really drew in uh, people from across Denver and from across Colorado because of their interest in the subject. And it was germane to the kinds of collaboration that was being discussed and, and planned at the convening. So think in your as you design your convening, what presentation or what presenter could be a draw and could really drive registration and drive interest in your event. There was also a dynamic areas for collaboration brainstorm exercise that we'll, we'll walk through in just a moment. And then that was followed by action-oriented voting on which are the most strong ideas uh, for collaboration. There was also an October convening relatively recently in Western Pennsylvania, and uh, Tim Arthur will talk more about uh, that event. Tim was the, the driving force among other key leaders for the Western Pennsylvania convening. Looking back on that event, there were a couple of key uh, components to it. There were some people at the Western Pennsylvania event that were new to the idea of a network, so we spent a bit of time talking about key network concepts and really getting people excited about the idea. We did participant introductions to uh, solidify some relationships among the participants. We did that brainstorming of areas of collaboration. And then we did a really interesting applied planning activity where we grouped people geographically, grouped people by county so that they could hatch plans that were relevant to their particular county. We had people from several counties at the convening. So we talked about that brainstorm activity, areas for collaboration. This is designed as a small group activity. So imagine you've got 60 people in your convening and you would break your group into six sets of 10. And that set of 10 people would rotate among the topic areas that you see listed on the slide. So uh, each group would start at one of those stations and then after 10 minutes of discussion, rotate around. And by the end of the, the session, each group would have, as a small group, discussed all six topics and added ideas to a flip chart at that station. So this is a road tested approach to this uh, this group brainstorm. And if you want to know more, there's actually a detailed plan for how to run this session on the CFPB uh, Elder Justice Network uh, site at consumerfinance.gov slash elder networks. So we'll be highlighting that later. But the, the purpose and the outcome of this session is by the end, you have a flip chart that's bristling with ideas for what are the ways that as a group we can 
collaborate on cross training and resource sharing. So here's, these are a couple of representative outputs from that brainstorming session. In Western Pennsylvania, we followed that brainstorming with prioritization. Imagine, you know, the, the sheer number of ideas was dozens of ideas to, to sort through. So the group really needed to prioritize. And the approach to doing that in Western Pennsylvania was to first brainstorm the activities, get them listed on a flip chart. That's step one to the far left here. Then use a matrix to evaluate how easy or hard each activity is and how important or less important the activity is in combating elder financial exploitation. And so people move the post-its representing specific ideas to different quadrants of the flip chart based on how easy they were and how important they were. And then finally, the group voted. You see the small circles on four of these ideas. That's the group deciding that of all of these ideas, these are the four we want to run with now so that we uh, direct our energies toward the, the highest impact and also the less, the least effortful activities. So again, both of these activities are described in plans that are on the CFPB website. We hope you will check those out because they really can add dynamism to your uh, convening and help move planning along. Colorado took a slightly different approach to uh, prioritizing the many ideas that were generated at that convening. Colorado did cell phone based polling. So after the Colorado group brainstormed a lot of ways they could collaborate with each other, the group then used their cell phones to vote on which were the most important ideas to move forward with. So uh, off to the right, you'll see these are two ways that uh, the cell phone polling software represented the top vote getters. And in uh, every case, there was a clear front runner. The group really coalesced around a particular uh, next step or priority to collaborate on. So whatever approach you take, it's just really important to, by the end of your convening, not only generate a lot of ideas, but zero in on those that uh, your group wants to tackle first. You can also use the cell phone polling uh, approach to generate short answer type input from your group, if, especially if you have a very large group. This is a great way to have people uh, contribute ideas at once rather than going person by person. And they all flow into uh, the system. They appear on the slide that the presenter is standing in front of. And you have all this great information to download and and uh, summarize after your convening is over. We've been talking mainly about in-person convenings, but virtual convenings can be really effective as well. And there's a tool from the CFPB that's linked here on the slide uh, on ways to increase engagement in your virtual convening. Whether you're doing it, you're convening in person or virtually, uh, it's really important to mix it up and to have it be a dynamic and interactive event. So that resource uh, gives you ideas for ways to do that. And those include ways to integrate polling into your event, ways to uh, enable video and use video effectively for your event. There are really interesting and really helpful and useful virtual whiteboard tools where multiple people can be swarming on a uh, brainstorming challenge. And there are also effective ways to use breakout rooms for small group discussion and planning. To recap, we have links here to the sample agenda template that we looked at. We have the areas for collaboration facilitator guide. That's the rotation, ro rotation style uh, session and the facilitator guide for the applied planning session that we looked at. And before we depart from the designing your day portion of, of our webinar today, we had a few tips. 
So one is to create a high level agenda for attendees, but a detailed agenda for the core team uh, that will help that group run the day and also facilitator guides for activities. Another tip is to throughout, throughout your planning and throughout the day, put encouraging collaboration at the forefront. A really key outcome of the day is to for people to leave with ways they can and will collaborate with each other. And also it's always a possibility to hire a third party facilitator, especially if that's not a skill that uh, is represented on your core planning team. At this point, uh, Lisa, I believe I'll turn the presentation back over to you for a discussion of maintaining momentum after your convening. Great, thanks, Ben. So after the convening, you wanna maintain momentum to grow and sustain your network. We don't want these events to just be one and done. The whole point of hosting a great convening is to get a network set up in the community that will be sustainable and that will combat elder financial exploitation for years to come. So the convening is just a first step towards that larger network goal. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to maintain that momentum after that first great convening. The first thing you'll wanna do is to connect with participants and send them a thank you email. This can encourage further engagement with the stakeholders who spent a lot of time and expertise during the convening. Miss Manners and your grandmother, or at least my grandmother would also probably like this idea of sending a thank you note out. So you can also use it as an opportunity to share slides or handouts and share an agenda or date for any follow-up meeting. So it's a great thing to do for those reasons as well. In addition to a thank you email, you may want to develop a convening readout, basically a summary of what happened at the convening. It can summarize highlights, network priorities, and next steps. And then you can send that readout to convening attendees and other stakeholders to keep things going. For example, on the right side of the slide here, you'll see a convening highlight from the May 2022 statewide convening that we did in Maryland. So it just gives you an example of something to highlight in a readout. That was a particularly exciting one because at the Maryland convening, we earned an official proclamation from the governor recognizing the efforts of the participants in that convening to combat elder fraud. So that's a nice thing to highlight in a convening readout and in a thank you email as well. So the Maryland convening readout, just to give you an additional idea, also included a list of participating organizations and those organizations had agreed to have that information shared. We also had key quotes from the sessions. You also, again, making sure to make sure you have permissions to share information, breakout summaries, participant takeaways, and also shared resources. And again, that readout can also include next steps to keep momentum going. On the next slide, you'll see information about the core team's follow-up activities. It would be a good idea for that core planning team who planned the convening to meet again as a follow-up meeting at least four to six weeks after the convening to make sure that you're keeping that momentum going. And at that follow-up meeting, if you haven't already established or selected a network coordinator, that's a good time to do it, or at least to discuss a potential candidate to approach and to appoint someone to act on his interim basis until you have a network coordinator. It's also a good time to think about naming your network and our network development guide has a naming activity to help you with that. Then in the next six to 12 months, a little further down the line, you'll wanna plan future network meetings as well as documenting planning tips from the last convening, forming working groups around priority areas you might have found out about during that convening, and also thinking about sources of training and education. Doing joint training and education among network members is a great way to keep that momentum going. So the next slide shows some examples of several actions that other communities have done and that you could do with your network after your convening to continue growing the network. One great thing to do is to establish working relationships with new partners. For example, some prior convenings have benefited from the involvement of state government agencies. In several cases, the state governments played leadership roles in planning 
the convenings, and they also drew helpful statewide attention to the importance of EFPRNs, like in Maryland. Another example is a network that established a working relationship with the district attorney's or DA's office, where a deputy DA was assigned to meet monthly with APS, and those meetings provided opportunities for case consultation, during which the deputy DA could assist caseworkers with writing reports to be referred to law enforcement for prosecution. There are all sorts of examples. For example, a statewide network engaged the Secretary of State's office to develop an outreach program for notaries as new partners in its elder justice initiative. Those are just a few examples. You can also identify and address new priorities, whether they may be racial, cultural, economic or geographic related priorities, uh, public education and outreach are another great priority. And as I said before, sometimes doing an education group with a variety of network members can be a good next step for after a convening. Um, several networks have proposed developing a speakers bureau that's available for community presentations. That's another approach to take. And you can help reach out to places where older adults are, like faith-based organizations, senior centers, and other gatherings to bring your network to older adults, um, to bring your elder fraud and elder financial exploitation expertise to them. There also are also tips about reviving networks um, through breakout group discussions that might help partners recommit themselves to collaboration also identifying gaps and challenges that might be limiting teams and pursuing funding for network staff. So you can find out a lot more about this on our website as well. On the next slide, you'll see some additional post convening steps to keep your network sustainable and to carry it on into the future. And these are kind of more of the practical things you may wanna do. The previous slide was more thematic and programmatic things, but these are some of the practical process things you might wanna do, like setting up regular recurring meetings that sets up an established schedule for the next 12 months that can keep the network from falling apart and keep it going on a regular cadence. You can also start identifying and engaging missing partners, maybe the convening, was terrific, but you weren't quite able to get law enforcement or say financial institutions involved. So that could be a next step for the network to take is to bring in those partners that weren't at the convening, but that you want to be part of your network. We can also evaluate the community impact against goals and priorities. This can be done qualitatively or quantitatively, or you can use evaluation forms that we have as part of the network development guide as well. One idea that a lot of networks have found very helpful is to create an information sharing platform because sometimes you may have a resource but others in the networks don't know about it or don't know how to get to it. Um, so this information sharing can be a great way to share information, whether it's an email list or something more complex. And finally, it's very important to regularly evaluate the network's impacts and goals to make sure that it is accomplishing your goals and missions. So this next slide, again, summarizes a lot of the resources for this stage, which is the maintaining momentum after your convening and helping to build your network in the year or so after your first convening. So we have that readout template that you can use to summarize your convening, to send out to people. We have the follow-up meeting materials and the naming network activity that I mentioned. So a whole host of tools in our network development guide, not just for planning the convening, but for sustaining your network afterwards. We also offer a couple of tips for keeping the momentum going, like making sure you determine the goals for the working group and measuring your progress and creating a referral guide. And there's a link there to more information how to create a referral guide to connect members with individuals or organizations outside their expertise that can help them address elder abuse issues in your community. 
So with the network guide and with the information on this slide, you can not only plan your convening, but also grow your network. So we really hope that you will use these tools. And now for an example of how to build networks in rural communities, I'm gonna turn it over to Tim Arthen, Deputy Secretary for the Pennsylvania Department of Banking and Securities. Tim. Thank you, Lisa. I'm really thrilled to be able to talk a little bit about the Western Pennsylvania convening um, that we did last October. And so uh, by way of starting, so we're at Pennsylvania Banking and Security Department. So we have the state regulator for banking and securities. And so over the past decade or so, we've had a really productive working relationship with the State Department of Aging, doing presentations to professionals as well as older adults about elder financial exploitation. And so back in 2019, we had said, hey, you know, there, there's really a need at, at kind of the county regional level to have these conversations that, that we're having with financial institutions at a, at a state level and really bring it down to the local level. And so in late 2019, we had started a conversation with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to do a convening out in Western Pennsylvania. Obviously that was sidetracked a little bit by COVID. And so we picked that conversation back up in, in 2022 to say, hey, we, we still have interest in doing this. And we are still coming out of the, you know, some things are virtual, some things are in person, but we really had a strong desire to do an in-person convening. So one of the, the reasons for that is Butler County, where, where we were planning to do the convening, is just north of Pittsburgh, which is a, a pretty large metropolitan area. But outside of Butler County, it gets very rural. And there are a lot of counties where the resources might not be as readily available. Um, folks are having to wear multiple hats and really the opportunity to come together and collaborate works better in that broad or in that um that broad based in person setting one of the the obstacles that we have in you know rural communities is broadband accessibility and so trying to do a virtual event where there might be issues around connectivity um you know folks being able to to hear one another um we thought we could mitigate that by by doing an in person event so we had determined that location working with stakeholders to say hey there's a need here um, and, and you'll see a little bit more for the rationale uh, of why we did butler county so with our steering committee organization we we focused on a couple key constituencies that we wanted to make sure were represented so we had um, local involvement from the county office the area agency on aging cfpb and then kind of at the statewide level we had adult protective services ourselves as the state banking and securities regulator, and then the office of the attorney general to bring in the law enforcement aspect. Because we wanted this convening to really touch on all of those multidisciplinary industries um, and efforts to, to have a robust conversation. And so this is just kind of a, a collection of the organizations that participated in the October event ranges from you know local government county government state federal um, financial institutions victim services adult protective services nonprofits um, and this was really facilitated by the steering group leveraging their network to say hey i'm going to go ahead and take you know this this category of stakeholders and try to get them to attend um, making sure that they're aware of it and so with each of the steering organization members doing that we are able to really saturate um, the area and, and making sure folks were aware of what it was we were trying to do, bringing stakeholders together and, and having that rural focus to say, hey, we recognize some of the, the difficulties, the obstacles in doing this in a rural setting. And uh, I'm pleased that we were able to get about 16 counties that were represented. Now, some of those counties had maybe five or six representatives show up, others that might have just been one representative from the the county area agency on aging but being able to to have that diversity really helped in the conversations in the convening because what we learned is counties appreciate hearing the struggles of other counties you know how are you experiencing this what are the challenges what are the the opportunities that you see and being able to take those lessons and apply it back in their county and I'll talk a little bit about how we did that in the afternoon session, because that was a really fruitful conversation. So the day of the convening, um, you know, previous slide mentioned that several months 
uh, of work from the steering committee to get things together. And we did that to make sure we had a concrete plan. Everybody was on board. We could get the information out so that, again, in-person convening, people knew, hey, let's block this day off. Um, that, that's one of the challenges with an in-person convening. You know, you, you have to travel, you have to factor that in. Um, that's not always easy to do, especially if you're representing a county and, and you're the mainline person and you're having to take a, you know, a chunk of your day out to go attend this convening. So we wanted to give people as much notice as we could. And you'll see in this map, again, Allegheny County being immediately adjacent below it, but then a lot of the other rural counties um, that you see highlighted in green, and the the gray counties don't mean that they're they're non-rural just from a a designation standpoint, but again, a lot of the similar challenges of you know older adults that may be facing isolation, um, you know proximity to neighbors might not be um, as close in maybe a metropolitan area, and so how protective services and victim services respond to that might be a little different. So location really mattered for us. We wanted it to be accessible um, and we relied on our local steering committee partners to really help with some of that, you know, on the ground logistical details. Um, us in, in Harrisburg, just kind of picking a spot wasn't going to work well. And we really wanted to, to make sure that those local that knew what was happening were able to drive the parts of the conversation um, and, and be responsive to what we were trying to do. So when we had the, the convening, uh, I wanna say it was about attendance around 50 or so. Um, again, great cross-sectional attendance by law enforcement, by financial institutions, Department of Justice, state government, adult protective services. And in the morning, we wanted to level set a bit. So we wanted to focus on areas of collaboration, challenges, and brainstorming. And so we broke these out, and Ben had it on a slide earlier, with six different um, tables where, where people would go to the different stations. And we broke these groups up to try to have diversity of background. We didn't want to have a group of participants that were all law enforcement talking to each other. We didn't want to have only APS talking to each other because it's really helpful to have conversations to say, hey, here's one of the limitations that that we've seen and be able to have somebody that's maybe on the other side of the report being able to weigh in and say, oh, well, that's interesting. I didn't know that. So each of these groups had a financial institution representative, adult protective services, um, county government. And so that allowed for a conversation and a dialogue where individuals really could feel like they were talking about what, what it is in the process they're doing their headaches, their frustrations, what they think would work well, and then come together as a group and, and report out. And so other counties, other attendees were able to say, oh, okay, well, that's that's interesting that they identified that. We, we were able to tackle that in this way. And then that shared knowledge and experience comes through um, in, in the lunch discussions and the break time discussions and really led to some some great relationship building. I know anecdotally, there was a, a financial institution that was saying they had no idea. There was a, a local county that had a task force that was already up and running. And just because they were at the convening, they were able to get plugged into that, that task force and, and really grow that relationship so that that task force now had a solid financial institution member that while they might not be able to talk about a specific case for a case review, they could say, hey, generally here's the perspective from a financial institution and that helps inform the working relationships um, and, and opens doors whenever there are problems or whenever there is a need to, to try to get a problem addressed. 15, 20 years ago, it, it was hard to get the different stakeholders in the same room. If you did, oftentimes they were talking over each other um, and, and there wasn't a lot of collaboration. With these types of convenings, you have everybody working toward the same goal. Hey, how do we protect our older adults? whether it's from the bank perspective, whether it's from a statutory requirement for APS, and really working together to figure out how can we work together within the bounds that we have to make a difference in older adults' lives. And one of the benefits that we had in the state was this, this convening came on the heels of a state-level financial exploitation task force. So some of these conversations had already been occurring at, at kind of a statewide level, 
And we really wanted to say, hey, this is great at a statewide level. Let's take it down to an even closer level at the local level and make sure this is starting to happen in, in every community. So for the afternoon session, we took a different approach. So this was the applied planning for counties. So in the morning, we had different um, industries, disciplines coming together, talking about what it is they're, they're seeing, what, how they're approaching different topics. The afternoon, it's okay. There, there's various representatives from different counties. Let's get together and let's talk about what we can do as a county. So for some counties, they already had an established task force network um, multidisciplinary team. Again, the, the verbiage might be um, different depending on where you are. But that was an opportunity for them to say, hey, did we, did we pull back a little because of COVID? Is there something we can start to do? Other counties, they were just figuring out, hey, how do we stand this up? Who do we need to involve? What should we be doing? And having that applied session really allowed counties the opportunity to say, what do we think would be helpful? As a steering committee, we didn't want to prescribe certain outcomes from this convening. We didn't want to say, hey, at the end of this convening, we want to X, Y, Z. We really wanted the discussion from the day to be owned by the counties so that they felt empowered to say, hey, we can do this. Let's get, get the folks together that we need to and start making a difference in our county or working across county lines. And I think what we're starting to see is those conversations that a couple of years ago were, oh, we should do this, are now starting to translate into the, hey, let me call the, the assistant district attorney up, see if we can get a meeting on the books just to figure out what this looks like. Again, with some of those practical next steps. Hey, can we get together on a monthly basis just to, to talk about what the scams are? Hey, can we bring in a financial institution for them to talk about generally what they're seeing? And so, where it was in the abstract of it would be nice if we could do this was now starting to be pen to paper. Hey, we're making a plan to do this. And as one of the, the steering committee members with, with the convening, the CFPB tools were really helpful because they provided the framework that we needed, but it wasn't so prescriptive where we said, oh, we have to do it this way. There really was an optionality, customization, whatever term you want to use, to how we went about doing the convening. Hey, we like this tool. We like this stakeholder list. Oh, we know something about this area. We need to make sure this person, this entity is involved. And I think having that bit of optionality with direction is what gave it such, um, such excitement from, from those that attended. We work with trade associations to say, hey, can you, can you help put this message out so that if you have members in that area, they know about it, they can get plugged in and they can get connected. So it really was, um, you know, kind of an all hands on deck there, looking at the tools and seeing, okay, how can we use this in its current form? Or how do we tweak it to reflect the, the geography of Western Pennsylvania? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's been happening and then I'm gonna transition to actually convening stakeholders in the rural community, as well as our unique role as the state banking and securities regulator in helping to put this together. So as Ben had mentioned, there is a follow-up that needed to happen after the event. So we had done this event in October. Uh, everybody went away um, with kind of their, a little bit of an action plan of, you know, here's what you can do with your county. We reconvened everybody on a call in January. That was an opportunity just to say, hey, what's, what's happening? Have you guys been able to make any, I'm sorry, sorry, um, have, have you as participants been able to make any inroads? What are you starting to plan? What are you starting to do? And a lot of the feedback was, you know, we're, we're digging out from the holidays, but uh, we're super excited. We're still having these conversations. We're still talking and sustaining that momentum. So it wasn't an event where people attended, they went home, they forgot what they had learned, and we had to remind them. It was, yes, we still want to do this. We still want to be committed to it. We're, we're also dealing with our day-to-day -day work. I think everybody on this call probably experiences that to some degree. So that call was not necessarily, um, uh, hey, you know, let's, let's get things into high gear. It was really an opportunity to say, hey, we, we've all committed to this idea. We want to support you in 
what looks what looks best for your community for your county and this is a reminder that we're here as a resource that these other resources are available and that reassurance that you don't have to do this alone what we've seen from that is there are there are a diff number of different events um, a lot of public awareness public engagement that are happen that's happening again involving different stakeholders so you have law enforcement you have financial institutions adult protective services that are hosting events um, to try to make seniors and older adults aware of the resources they have available, what to do if they're experiencing elder financial exploitation, and really building on those relationships that we were able to um, introduce it back in the convening. And so we, we also wanna make sure that attendees and, and those that would connect with attendees at the convening understood that this isn't a once and done thing, that this is a very sustained um, building blocks approach and that every county is going to look a little different. And so when we talk about convening stakeholders in rural communities, what we found from the, the conversation was there a, a lot of emphasis on those that are in the community that are, are the trusted entities. So we, we heard from stakeholders about, oh, well, my postman um, or my, my postwoman is really somebody that knows what's going on being able to tie them in with what is happening in the community where they can lend their expertise so that that can leverage what law enforcement is doing, what adult protective services is doing, and, and all the other entities that, that are trying to do this. With bridging gaps, we, we tried to use the time to figure out the root cause on things that aren't working or things that aren't happening. Sometimes it's as simple as, I don't know why we do this and trying to understand, okay, is there a real reason for it? Does someone need to take ownership of it to make it happen? And in, in rural communities in particular, not that it's unique to, to rural communities, but tends to happen, is it's, it's picking up the phone and it's calling a counterpart or a counterparty and saying, hey, let me pick your brain on this. And even those types of conversations can be extremely helpful in trying to build the network and saying, how are you guys tackling this? How, how is this being, being made more effective where you are? Because we hear from other counties that you guys have something that's really good and working well and able to engage all of the entities that are involved. And that goes to the feedback loop, being able to hear from colleagues, how are you doing this? Understanding how challenges are being confronted with similar resource constraints. Uh, again, oftentimes in rural, rural counties, there's an individual that's wearing multiple hats. They're, they might be tasked with doing different responsibilities that really stretches their ability to sit down and, and do something for a county task force. If, if you recall the old phone tree, that, that's a little bit of how um, we found the, the convening stakeholder list to, to work. So again, we had networks that we leveraged those that were more local were able to to reach out and oftentimes these are their neighbors it's somebody that they um they go to rotary club with it might be somebody that attends the same place of worship and saying hey i'm doing this uh this convening next week with you know on elder financial exploitation i know that you're an accountant and i know that you have some older adult clients why don't you come and and that type of familiarity is really helpful. And especially when we got to the convening itself, there was already a level of trust because those that were in the room were, were brought by somebody that, that they knew. And so there was almost an immediate sense of, okay, we're all in this, you know, in this space to try to make a difference for the benefit of older adults. I might not know the person sitting across from the table, but I know that they're invested in this work because of their work with so-and-so at the county DA's office or at the sheriff's office. And that really establishes that trust quickly that you can't, you can't replicate um, as well in a virtual setting. And so just very briefly to end, um, I wanted to talk about just our role as the state regulator, since it, it is a little unique um, in, in how we were one of the, the driving forces behind this convening. As I mentioned at the onset, we had been doing work with older adults for uh, over a decade. And that level of 
commitment to this topic, I think helped establish some of the credibility with those that were attending. So they might not have known of who we are, but if they called their AAA, their local area agency on aging, they were familiar with us and they, they knew the work that we had been doing. And so it really helped folks get tied in to what we wanted to do. Being a, a state cabinet agency, it allowed us to leverage additional other state resources. So being able to pick up the phone to a sister agency and say, hey, we know you're doing some work around this. Can we tap you into this? And that's really helpful just to be able to have, again, that relationship where we can bring somebody in or we can, we can say, hey, we know of this resource. And it allows us the opportunity to make those connections where maybe there was a, a bit of a divide or, oh, I didn't know how to get in contact with this financial institution or you know, this, this other entity and really start to make those inroads where you know, something so small might have been keeping, keeping work from happening. And so that is a little bit about the Western PA convening. So I believe at this point, I will turn it back over to Paul. Well, thank you, Tim. Actually, I think, Jennifer, you've got some uh, resources that you would want to uh, share with us right now. Back to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Paul, Tim, Lisa, Ben. Great stuff. Um, OK, I'm just very quickly going to just go to the slide. Oh, that's not the slide. Where is it? Did I pass it? It was forwarded for me. Thank you. Um, I won't spend too much time on it because I know we're we're running short and we want to get to a few questions. Um, but finding a network, finding an existing network is a very frequent question, and it's a really good question. There is a national um, uh, resource uh, of networks that are run by government agencies, and that's on the DOJ website, and you can see it there. And then another way to find a local network, which may or may not be run by a government website, because I can tell you the DOJ's list is not exhaustive. Um, it's good, but it's not exhaustive would be to contact your local AAA, Area Agency on Aging, or Adult Protective Services or Legal Services, um, and ask them for, you could say Elder Justice Network, you could say an MDT, um, Financial Abuse Specialist Team, something alike, but um, they may not know what you mean by the word network, but generally known as a multidisciplinary team or Financial Abuse Specialist Team or an Elder Abuse Prevention Task Force, something to that effect. And you can find um, your local area agency on aging by going to eldercare.acl.gov. And that's actually a fantastic resource for all sorts of elder care, elder uh, issues, including housing and transportation, all kinds of things. But if you scroll down, I, I went and checked it the other day. You scroll down, there's usually a section on elder abuse. So you just plug in your zip code. And if you are concerned about uh, an older person in another state, could be somebody you know, or a friend or whatever, um, you can just put in their zip code and come up with a local area agency on aging. So if you're a financial institution and you've got somebody who's, a, let's say, a snowbird um, who's in your area, um, but you want to get to uh, the agency, area agency on aging where they are, um, just know that the zip code could be either, um, either where you are or it could be where they are or where they came from. Um, and then the guide, again, is at consumerfinance.gov uh, forward slash elder networks. That's our network development guide with all the tools and resources we've been talking about. And I think with that, I'll turn it over to Paul for questions. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jennifer and everyone on the panel. Uh, this has been so rich in practical suggestions recommendations and we are now actually going to allow you to see who we are uh, i think our cameras are coming on right now and there we are so we are alive and well and listening in and it's, it really has been for me just, just such an education in practicalities um, i'm encouraging you to put some uh, quick fire questions in the chat box um, if we do get them and we're willing to stay on just for two or three minutes after the half hour has gone by at the bottom of the hour, we can do that. Uh, but I just want to start off with Jennifer, at the very beginning, you mentioned 
this uh, phrase, which people have commented on actually in the chat box. What is a payments association and how do they be part of this network? Yeah, um, payments associations are, they're an association of, of payments professionals. And I'm, I'm probably, you know, I, I don't want to butcher their industry's uh, description of themselves, but they're actually the individuals in financial institutions who process payments. And payments could be, you know, checks, like that has to go from one place to another, or an originator bank to a depository bank. Actually, Tim might be a really good person to describe them, but they're, um, they're really important. They do the electronics payments, the point of sale payments, and all the payments you're doing on like PayPal or, you know, uh, your, your credit card, all that funding that goes back and forth um, has to get transferred somehow, and that's through the payment system. But the payment system also, obviously, if money is moving, that's where the fraud is. That's where the financial exploitation, the money has to get from one place to another unless it's cash. If it's cash, that's a different, that's outside the payment system. Um, so payments professionals are in, I, I think, every single institution, and they can be so helpful. Um, we you know, 20 years I've been working on this issue, and I used to work with the Payments Association that covers nine Western states, including California, where I was, and they were very, very engaged. In fact, Paul and I met um, uh, in San Diego, where there was a Payments Association was sponsoring an elder uh, abuse event, and um, and that was how, it was, I knew I would meet Paul anyway, but that was how we, uh, it was a really sort of uh, triggered by that in the in the end, and um, we had uh, an experience in Hawaii with uh, a payment association called Matcha, where they really stepped up, and they're out of uh, Wisconsin. They cover Hawaii and Maryland and part of Illinois, and so they um, did a lot of they've done a lot of work with us um, to produce events. They produce helped produce the Maryland event and did a tremendous invested a tremendous amount of energy. In the, in the Hawaii events, but what they can do for you and your network is they can help you to find a payments professional in a, in a financial institution who you can get a hold of, hopefully, and who may be able to help you track the transaction, follow the money, and possibly, if you're really lucky, um, even be able to stop a transaction or come up with some of the documentation behind the transaction. Um, and they're, they're fairly new to the elder justice field as we know them, but they've really been behind the scenes all along. We always have talked about, you know, the teller line is one thing, the managers are another thing, you've got the legal division and the securities people, but somewhere in there that money's moving, and those are the payments people. So, uh, Paul, do you want to say anything more about that? Well, just, just to say from a practical point of view, um, I've had the benefit of connecting with people like Matcha and other payments associations because they can plug me into uh, contacts that I didn't know existed. And I think they need to be part of your uh, collaboration. Um, in, a, in a recent example, uh, Jenny and I were able to reach out to a payments association and they linked us in with different networks, or one stretching as far as Hawaii, California, Illinois. And that way, there's just the potential for actually stopping the financial bleeding before it gets too extensive. Um, there's been a great question has come in from Jan Friedman, which I'd like to address to the, to the panel for a quick, brief uh, response from each of you, if possible. Is there a role for these networks uh, in reaching out to a senior citizen who's clearly the victim of financial exploitation, but is competent as to all areas of their life, how can such a network be effective in reaching someone who is choosing to be exploited? Who'd like to be brave enough to start that off? I'm open to having a go at it. <laughs> um, it, every network has to build their own programs and decide who does what and what capacity they have to respond, which under, you know, our normal circumstances of calling APS or law enforcement, those are generally the first responders in all cases. Um, 
As far as reaching out to people individually, um, I think that it's a matter of, you know, a sort of a public awareness communications campaign type of thing. Um, we hear a lot from financial institutions about this person is doing this, but they have the right to do what they want with their money, but we're trying to talk them out of it. And they don't believe that the romance scammer is trying to scam them, or they don't believe that they haven't won this money. Um, and so I think that the having the network connection say where that scam is taking place, like at the financial institution where the where the money, uh, the payments is start the payments are being generated. Um, that collaboration of being able to call APS, your, your your contact at APS or at law enforcement, or perhaps there's a victim services person, or there's a um, a consumer um, uh, uh, protection attorney at, at the uh, DA's office who might give you know someone a call if they think that they can stop it. So having that collaboration gives you a lot more opportunities to have people who are available or able to respond. And I did see a situation um, it was a long time ago, but it was quite amazing when a letter carrier, a, post, a postal letter carrier, um, saw uh, an, an older man in his late 80s who was recently widowed and was very lonely and very despondent. And he was getting all kinds of mail and was giving tons of money away. And um, I tried to approach him and he wasn't interested and others, APS had been called on him a bunch of times and he was caught, he had capacity to make decisions, but he was being scammed. We figured out 13,000 a month was going out the door. And we found out that he was retired Coast Guard. And so we found a law enforcement officer who was also retired Coast Guard, who was not in the network, but we consulted with the network and they got the, uh, the coast, the coastie, as we call him, the, the the cop who was the coastie, to go over there and speak to him. And next thing you knew, we knew the guy had a new job, and that was to help the cops get the scammers. And so that was because of people collaborating and coordinating and finding the best person um, to approach. So I hope that's helpful. Great. Anyone else want to weigh in before we wrap up? In a way, Jan is articulating the outcome of the the convening and the, the network idea, you know, mm -hmm. that, that sort of seamless collaboration that Jennifer, you're just talking about can't happen unless the relationships are there among the, the various stakeholders. And that's what the convening is for. And that's what the networks are. Great. Yeah. No, that, somebody had, sorry. Somebody had the back, had the actual direct phone number to the supervisor of the local APS who could then dispatch or find somebody. I mean, it was a matter of literally having people on speed dial. Um, that's what networks are like. Great. I just want to give Lisa and Tim a final word that they want to, anything, any other passing comment they'd like to wrap up with before I wrap it all up. I think Jennifer and Ben summed it up well that uh, these networks are designed to address just the sort of issue that Ms. Friedman brought up and that we hope that you all in your communities will start convenings using this information and build networks and you can use that online development guide at consumerfinance.gov slash elder networks to do it. And I put up a link to, um, I don't usually use uh, Wikipedia for this kind of thing, but in this case, they had a very comprehensive list of all the payments associations in the country. There's not a lot of them um, and all the states they cover. So you, uh, they don't have a lot of contact information, but this will give you a head start to finding your payments association who you can invite to your core convening group. And that'll help you to engage uh, payments professionals along the line. Tell them I think. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. All right. Tim, any fi any final words from you, Tim? Just, just a final word that these networks and these teams can be great at developing resources so that if somebody is experiencing um, an issue where they're they're allowing themselves to be exploited and nobody can really get through to them, that those teams can develop resources to to say, you know, how do I deal with an older adult who is knowingly participating in a scam and being able to leverage the you know the wealth of expertise that comes from law enforcement from financial institutions so that maybe there is that that coast you or that that community connector that can speak to that older adult and, and really get through to him or her 
Thank you, Tim. Lisa, we just had a final comment asking for the website uh, address. It's probably on the slide at the end, but... Uh, uh, consumerfinance.gov slash elder networks. And it looks like Ben just put it in and Nicole just put it in the chat. Thank you both. Hey, they're, they're on the ball. So again, <laughs> panel, thank you so much, uh, Jennifer, Tim, Ben, and Lisa for, for your expertise, for, for the practical suggestions. It really has been a, a great uh, uh, resource rich presentation. So with that, I just, we just got some final slides. Uh, Nicole, if you just want to uh, post those for us, that'd be great. Uh, remember that we do have some uh, more of these uh, um, webinars coming up. So next Wednesday, who's who in Elder Justice Networks. The following Wednesday, age-friendly banking and opportunities for collaboration. And then the final wrap up is on Thursday, June the 1st, financial uh, uh, care being. And remember, sorry, you can also go back to the uh, February, March uh, webinars that we did through this special uh, YouTube, uh, which is on there. So to, you can always take a snapshot of that and then plug it into YouTube and uh, watch those at your leisure. So again, here's some more uh, resource information and for some contact information. I'm sorry we didn't get to some of uh, a couple of the other questions, I think, uh, that were just posted, but hopefully uh, somebody's monitoring that and they will uh, contact you about that. Uh, particularly Jody Stimson wrote, wrote a question in there. So um, again, my thanks to, to everybody for being part of this uh, great, webinar thank you for for being with us today and we just hope that you will be energized to either start a, a collaboration and a network or expand an existing network because if you do we will see positive results and it's all about protecting our older adults so once again thank you so much to everybody and that's it for today